just a wee dach and doris. It's a wee trap, that's all. <coughs> Well, if you hadn't figured out, today we're in Scotland. Uh, that's why I'm wearing, wearing my deer stalker. And we're going to talk about whiskey. And um, I will tell you, there is more nonsense written about the origin of whiskey than any other drink on earth. There are claims that it goes back to ancient times, that St. Patrick brought it to Ireland with Christianity, that the Scots learned it directly from the Muslims, while they were on the Crusades, I guess a couple went along. But in fact, we know distillation technology wasn't um, prevalent in Europe until the late Middle Ages, and it started in Italy and radiated, radiated out from there. And even when we find the word aquavita, which in the Gaelic language is ushkebach or ushkeba or biata, it simply means water of life. So it's the same word exactly, but it doesn't necessarily denote the grain-based liquor that we know today as whiskey. Uh, now for a simple working definition, whiskey, S-K-Y, is simply alcohol made from grain and by convention aged in wood. So it is classified in the trade as a brown liquor. Okay, That means things that go into wood, um, like bourbon, like whiskey, like... Um, Rum can be brown too, aged in wood. So this is distinguished from its predecessor, or what would be used to make whiskey, which is moonshine, white lightning, hooch, which is clear and it's unaged. Um, and uh, you know, if you make a cocktail out of it like this, then it doesn't have any color. And that is distinguished from moonshine, white lightning, hooch, all those things. Um, which can become anything, really, you know. And, and in fact, they become vodka, usually. So what makes it whiskey is entirely the color and flavor of oak. Since the alcohol itself doesn't actually have much flavor. It can, if you peat the malt and do other various, if you uh, um, do various things to it, you can change the color. But basically, it's just, just uh, grain alcohol. Now the drinks that are covered by the term whiskey, and there's a little bit of confusion here, so I'm gonna try and clarify it for you. That includes scotch, which is its own special thing. Irish whiskey, which is quite different. Canadian whiskey, which is very light and fruity and usually based on rye and corn and other grains that they blend after distillation to give you something very consistent. Um, Seagram's is a very good example of that, Canadian club, that sort of thing. And then bourbon, which is an entirely different drink. It's an American drink made of sour mash corn uh, based whiskey from Kentucky. It has to include at least 51% corn. Um, and you may be um, lured into thinking that Jack Daniels is a kind of uh, bourbon because it's filtered through maple charcoal, um, but there, it's actually Tennessee whiskey. It's not, it can't be called bourbon legally. It doesn't have to do with the place. It has to do with the process. There are a few other forms like rye, which is experiencing a lovely renaissance now. You, you know, even when I started teaching this course, I could maybe find one bottle of real rye now. There's many, many. Um, and then there's, um, you know, grain-based things that are called American whiskey, which um, kind of uh, go back to an older time. Michter's is a very good example of that, uh, that tries to replicate the sort of stuff that George Washington was brewing. Now, in general, Canada and England and the U.S. use whiskey W-H-I-S-K-Y, whereas Ireland, and, and sometimes the U.S. spell it um, whiskey, sorry, <laughs> Canada, England, and the U.S. use S-K-Y, right? And Ireland and the U.S. spell it S-K-E-Y. There's a difference. Um, there are ex exceptions, actually, that can confuse this, so it's not a steadfast rule. But whiskey, either way you spell it, can be made from any number of grains. Barley is prominent. Wheat rye, um, close relative of, of wheat, of course, and corn um, in different mixtures. So it's the process which defines it is not the grain itself, it's the barrel aging, and that will give it the color and the flavor. Now, just as with beer making, the grains are malted, 
soaked until they germinate, and then quickly stopped and dried either with hot air, which is the industrial way to do it, or with Scots whiskey, it is often peat. Now, what peat is actually earth. It's, it's dinosaurs that have been rotting for millions of years, and people actually go out into the fields, dig it up with a hoe or with a, a sort of a rototiller kind of thing, and then they burn it. And it's very, very high in oil, of course, and it gives the grain a very smoky flavor and aroma. So that's where much of the very unique, you know, single malt whiskey gets its flavor from, is from the peating process, actually. And then the grains are coarsely milled. They're soaked with hot water in a mash tun, just like you'd make beer. And then the starch is converted to sugar, remember, and the wort is drained off, cooled, and then yeast is added, which converts the sugar to alcohol and carbon dioxide. So you have actually at this point a kind of beer, you know, if you were to make beer out of wheat and corn and other things, um, it's not refined beer, it's, it's actually kind of crude, but it doesn't matter at this point because you're going to take the alcohol off of it. And the watery part, where the whole fermented lot goes into a still, um, either a pot still, which is like an alembic, you know, the ancient ones that we were talking about before, or it's something quite different, which is called a column still or a coffee still, not coffee like the drink C-O-F-F. EY after the man who invented it. It's a long column. Um, <clears throat> now, either way you do this, uh, copper is essential for the process because there are some nasty sulfurous compounds that come out that attach themselves to the copper and stay in the pot rather than going up into the final spirits. So you'd have a kind of sulfurous rotten egg, you know, kind of smell in your final drink if you didn't use copper. <clears throat> so they've all got some, at least a copper plate or something in there. Now, what they usually do is the very first of the run, the very beginning, called the tops, are taken off because those will have sort of off flavors and sometimes uh, different kinds of alcohol, alcohol in them. And then the tails, the very end of the whole process, is also removed, which is more watery and, um, and other off flavors. So the first to come out of the still and the last to come out of the still are actually thrown away. And what comes out can be um, 70 to 80 percent alcohol or uh, what's what's called 140 to 160 proof proof is of course double the number of the percentage right and then they usually water it down almost all whiskey is uh, watered down to 40 percent but some stillers actually do bottle it at the um, put it right in the barrel at cask strength okay so it's getting it's drawing more of that uh, the aromas and the tannins and the vanillins and stuff out of the wood into the flavor the higher the the uh, whiskey, the higher and less water in there. Now, again, as I said, most of the flavor, of course, the color comes from a barrel. I want you to imagine a big old barrel. Actually, if you can see right over my shoulder, there's a little one sitting there, but that's that actually works fine for, for a small amount. Um, it, it's a um, usually about 50 to 53 gallons is about a barrel. Barrels are normally American oak or European. And bourbon, in fact, has to be by law in new white oak barrels that have been charred. And this is something I haven't talked about. But the inside of the barrel, once it's made, <clears throat> they light a taper, they char the inside of the whole thing, burn it slightly. And if you burn it a lot, you get a very darker kind of flavor and toasty flavor. If you char it very little, you get something lighter and more um, fruity, fruit flavors come through, strangely enough. Um, so the degree of the charring is absolutely crucial to the final color and the flavor. And the type of oak is also crucial. The colder the climate where it grow, grows, the better, because then they grow slower, they have a tighter texture. You can imagine the rings on a tree being much, much tighter together, um, and then less alcohol evaporates. So it's actually very good for the whole process. Because in fact, what you lose in a barrel can amount to about 12 gallons. So that's four years of aging, which is kind of average. This is called the angel share because presumably it just evaporates through the barrel and the angels, that's why they're so happy. <laughs> they're, they're, they're absorbing that. <clears throat> in fact, if you've ever been to a distillery, you can smell the whiskey intensely. It's um, in the air and you get a little dizzy just from smelling it, seriously. Um, and of course, because the alcohol is highly flammable, where you store these barrels is extraordinarily dangerous. Uh, for bourbon, for example, they put them in these special buildings called a, a rickhouse, um, kind of a big wooden warehouse for barrels. 
um, and nothing sharp is allowed in there because if it falls down and causes a spark against a piece of metal, it will the whole place will blow up, and nothing. Um, you know, nothing, uh, I think, you know, they're just very, very careful <laughs> because every now and then a whole rickhouse will go up and that's hundreds and thousands of barrels that they lose in years of production. And this, this actually happened um, in the case of one distillery I visited um, back in 2010. They, they lost several decades of bourbon that they were storing there because a fire happened. So, so the rickhouses are separate, but one goes off, it's, it, it explodes. Now... Scotch, surprisingly enough, and I know this is going to sound really weird because Scotch is the older beverage and it's the, you know, the, the, the ancestor to these others. Um, usually it is made in used bourbon barrels. I know that sounds really weird. After they're done making bourbon, they send them to Scotland and they make it there. Or sometimes use sherry barrels and they will actually impart a very different flavor uh, depending on which one they use. The whiskey has to stay in there for a minimum of two or three years. And the older it is, of course, the more expensive it is, and um, and usually the, the taste is better. So so ten years is about common. Um, some go up to twenty years or more, and then at a certain point it kind of stops improving with with aging. And so the key to all bourbon making, of course, is how long the distiller will sit on his stock while it ages, because remember he's tying up all this money of investment, and the longer it sits there. Um, the longer, the more precarious his investment is, let's put it that way. And if he has the time to put it up, then it's, um, it really becomes something very worthwhile. Um, so in single malts and unblended whiskey, um, what happens is after that aging, it goes into the bottle. The aging, once it goes into the bottle, that's the end of it, okay? It will never corrupt, mind you, okay? It won't go bad, but it stops t changing, the flavor stops changing, or it changes a little. Actually, there are people who say it changes, but it's... Um, uh, but the aging date that you see, 10, 12 years, whatever, is the day it goes into the barrel, not into the, into the bottle, sorry. It's the barrel that gives it the flavor and the aging. And it usually doesn't get any better in the bottle. Uh, but every year and every barrel are different. So you get a kind of good thing out of, out of single malt whiskey. You know, you're going to get every year is just going to be slightly different flavor and depending on the crop. Because remember, we're dealing with a vegetable here, okay? Now for most whiskey is blended. Now what that means is that they take a little bit of this good flavor they like from that year, they take a little bit of this good flavor, and they mix it all together to get a consistent product year to year, which consumers of course expect to have a certain consistency. It's of course less interesting in the end because you don't have that fun, you know, surprise of whatever that year is going to yield. And uh, you know, they, they have a kind of signature flavor of the brand and a specialist, the nose, you know, who's going to kind of taste everything and, and mix it so they have consistency. Um, now, if you're buying a cheaper whiskey, they will often add caramel coloring to get the con color the consumer expects. And it's an assumption on the part of people who drink, drink this stuff that it is um, the darker it is, the older it is, and the better it is, which is not true at all. And the other odd thing is that the alcohol doesn't actually come under the same regulations that uh, food and, um, and most other beverages do when it comes to additives and flavorings. This is a whole separate department. It's not the USDA, it's tobacco, firearms, and alcohol. Don't ask me how that happened in the US. Um, that's what it is. Uh, so, so they're allowed to put things in that are flavoring agents like vanillin, or which is artificial vanilla flavored, gotten from wood pulp. And they're allowed to synthesize chemical flavorings that kind of give it a toasty, caramelly kind of flavor. So cheap booze can have a lot of garbage in it, including artificial flavors. It doesn't have to appear on the label at all. Okay? And there's no actual way to figure out if a spirit you buy has been doctored. But you can sometimes taste it. If you buy something and it has this weird kind of cloying sweetness and perfume to it, you can guess that it is a fake uh, flavoring. Um, and trust me, it will give you a headache. <laughs> this is where it comes from. It's not from the good stuff. It's from, um, it's from the, the junk they put in there. Now, where whiskey comes from, this is a much harder question. Impossible to figure out. Uh, the word whiskey doesn't appear in the English language until the 18th century. And it's antecedent that, the, and I'm always mispronounced this. I went to Ireland and they told me, what are you saying? So it's, it's a ushkebah, okay, I think. It's the water of life, okay? 
It goes back a few centuries before the 18th century, but we're not sure that it actually meant the same thing that it does today, because sometimes um, the recipes, or when people mention it, they, they include raisins, which seems like, what is that? I mean, it would taste good, but whiskey, I don't know. John French, a guy who wrote in the 17th century, had a recipe, and he calls it Ushka bath, or Irish aqua vitae, and he said it's made from clear alcohol canary sack. You should know what that is, right? It's a sherry that comes from the Canary Islands. Um, raisins, dates, cinnamon, nutmeg, and licorice. So it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a distilled spirit, sort of, but, you know, it's got all these flavorings in it, as we know they did all the time to, to, to um, alcohol. And, and again, this doesn't mean it tastes bad. It probably tastes really good, but they're calling it um, whiskey. And the first reference to whiskey making that's certain comes from 1494, a Scottish exchequer's rolls when the account lists a weight of 1,000 pounds of malt used to make aqua vitae. And that would make about 50 gallons. So that's, that's a pretty, pretty decent quantity. Um, a few years later, in 1506, King James IV of Scotland granted a monopoly to the Guild of Barber Surgeons. So it's clear that it's still really a distilled spirit. It's still a medicine. You know, this is, this is why the, the barber surgeons have a, have a hold of it. Um, now, this is not to say that people weren't also distilling it illegally, and it's highly likely that people were privately making moonshine for their own recreational use very, very easily uh, and simply. Can you see my still up there in the corner? Maybe you can. It's behind that, that stuff right there. It's very easy to make, as I've been talking about. So throughout the 16th century, production ramped up. To such an extent, the government eventually began saying, well, we, we really ought to tax this stuff. And the Scottish were really the first to create an industry out of whiskey making, with distilleries both in large cities, uh, the Edinburgh and Glasgow, but also in the highlands, in the outlying western islands. The Isle of Ila is a very good example. Um, and the, the point is that from this early date, they figured out that they could sell this to other people. They sold it to the English mostly. And the English have long been drinkers of scotch, even before the two countries were united. Much of it was, of course, also distilled illegally in small hidden stills to avoid the excise man. If you know, there's a wonderful Irish song, run like the devil from the excise man, keep the smoke from rising Barney, meaning if you, they see the smoke coming up in the hills, the, uh, the tax men are going to come and demand their share. So you run. <laughs> okay, so, um, and of course, the other side of the whole coin is the illegal smuggling of whiskey through these hidden distribution networks, which are, are apparently extensive. Um, now, what is most remarkable about scotch, again, not what I'm drinking, alas, it's too hot. It was 80 to something degrees today. But in any case, it differs from place to place. And the way that we've been talking about wine as expressing terroir, whiskey is even more intense. The differences are dramatic. They're, they're night and day. And of course, they have a lot to do with how the whiskey is made. There's no doubt about that. But it's also that you find, for example, <clears throat> the Ila. And Ila is I-S-L-A-Y, spelled like Islay. Um, those like Lafroig and Lagavulin taste intensely of smoke, almost like gasoline um, in a weird way, and seaweed and iodine, and you get a little salty finish in it. And I know this sounds really bizarre to you, but it's, it's the, one of the acknowledged um, unique flavors in really good Scotch whiskey. And lowland whiskey is, is actually very different, but it's very pleasant. It has this kind of undertone of honey and sweetness that just comes through, I guess because of the heather and the, I don't know what it is. Um, Highland whiskeys, which are much easier to find, um, are um, Glenlivet, Glenmorangie. If you see Glen next to a, the name, it usually means it's a Highland whiskey. They're very fruity. Um, and how this happens, I don't, it's maybe just the, the rocky soil, it's the climate, it's the sun when the, when the grains are growing. Who knows? And within that area, uh, in the north, is also Speyside, and you find um, uh, very popular brands like Glenfiddich and Macallan. Um, those are great, great whiskeys. Um, and each one is very different. It's, and it partly depends on the water. It depends on the quality of the grain, of course. And they usually don't grow it themselves. They buy it from local farmers. And the decisions that take place in the distillery are going to make a really, really big difference. You know, the length, the amount of toasting on the oak, the amount of 
um, peat that goes into it. <clears throat> There's salt spray up against the side of the building and you're going to taste salt. So, so whiskey is as variable as wine and reflects terroir, I would say even more so than does wine in many respects, because wine has kind of been pushed into um, very narrow varietals and people have a certain taste and they expect the wine to taste like that. So there aren't really funky, weird, there are weird, funky wines out there, but, but they're not, they don't sell well. Weird, funky scotch, yes, people love it. They want this stuff. So of all drinks also, the interesting thing about scotch whiskey is that it becomes the drink of the nation. It becomes a drink to remember who you, who you are, where you come from, uh, of nationalism. Remember, we were talking about nationalism a couple of weeks ago. And it becomes more firmly associated with Scotland than any other consumable good. Just like we talked about Lederhosen in Germany in the 19th century, in Scotland, think of the kilt, right? Very distinctively odd Scottish dress that you, you know, you not going to a proper affair, you wear a kilt and bagpipes and of course haggis, which is a um, sheep stomach stuffed with guts and oatmeal and pepper and spices. It's, it's a wonderful thing, trust me. So the national poet of Scotland, this is Robbie Burns, as he wrote an ode to haggis, he also wrote an ode to scotch. And I'll just read a couple of stanzas. He wrote in this kind of weird um, Scots dialect, which is impossible to... Um, reproduce <laughs> but I'll, I'll give it a shot okay so gee him strong drink until he wink okay that's clear enough that's sinking in despair so whoever is say, is sad give him a strong drink until he starts to go like this and liquor good to fight his blood that pressed with grief and care and he's actually spells it this way so i'm reading exactly what he said he writes down there let him bows and deep carouse with bumpers flowing o'er till he forgets his love or debts and minds his griefs no more. Let other poets raise a fracas about vines and wines and drunken bacchus. Some people like wine to hell them. And crab names the stories rackus. And great our lug I sing to his Scotch bear can make us in glass or jug. O thou, my muse, good old Scotch drink, where through wimpling worms thou jink. <laughs> no idea what that means. O richly brown ream o'er the brink in glorious fame. Inspire me till I lisp and wink to sing thy name. So drink so much that you lost your power of speech. Let husky wheat the, the haws adorn, and eight set up their awny horn, and peas and beans and e'en or morn perfume the plain, leaves me on thee, John Barleycorn, the king of grain. John Barleycorn is barley, right? So he's, he's saying, you know, you might grow peas or beans or something other, but if you grow corn, barley, that's wonderful. Of thee of Scotland, Chowser Cood. <laughs> This is hilarious. Cud is cud. When the cow chews his cud, you know, the ruminants throw up and chew and then goes back down another stomach. So Scotland, if it's chewing its food, has whiskey in there. In supple scones, the whale of food scones are, are big um, biscuits, okay? <clears throat> or tumbling in the boiling fluid with kale and beef. Now, kale, you think is a modern, fashionable thing, but no, they added a lot of kale. kale it is kale. And beef... But when thou pours thy strong heart's blood, there thou shines chief. So, um, so this is a um, symbol of utter Scottishness, is the fact that you drink great whiskey, and, um, and this is what makes you strong, and, and it's the best of all products. <laughs> it's very, very characteristic. Of course, this is great advertising too, right? Um, he wrote this in the 18th century, but, it, but it's, uh, you know, to get your Englishmen and your other people around the world to drink it, you, you make a, a good kind of myth of the origin and sell it to them really beautifully. So, so interestingly, fashion, you know, England and Scotland became united with uh, James I of Scotland in 1603, um, but they, uh, you know, there were civil wars in <laughs> that century, a lot of cantankerous um, animosity between the two, but they remained united and they were actually made uh, into a formal union in 17, I think it's 1701. Um, so the Queen of England is also the Queen of Scotland, remember. 
and Queen Victoria especially spent time up in her castle outside of Edinburgh. This is Balmoral. Um, tartans became very popular fabrics. Englishmen learned to take a dram of whiskey, a dram is a little, a little a measuring cup. A golf suddenly became a popular sport. Bizarre thing. People up in St. Andrews in the, in the, in the heather are batting around balls. Suddenly the, people started playing golf. And English also, and, and to some extent even Americans, had this weird affection for Scotland. And the association was that they were backward, quaint, drunk all the time. And, uh, and, the, and you know, stern and, and um, you know, puritanical, but, but nonetheless drinking whiskey. So, so the, the song that, that I played when we started, this is a guy named Harry Lauder. He was a uh, popular uh, music hall entertainer in the early 20th century. And the song was a we dachen doris, okay? And that means you have a little drink before you leave someone's house. Make sure you have one for the road, basically, okay? So let me, let me read this to you, because you probably couldn't hear the words. But there's a good old Scottish custom that has stood the test of time. It's a custom that has been carried out in every land and clime, of course, by Scotsmen. When brother Scots are gathered, it's I the usual thing. Just before we say goodnight, we fill our cups and sing. And why the hell don't I just sing it? Just a wee dach and Doris. It's a wee drop, that's all. Just a wee dach and Doris. Before you gang wa. That means before you go away, let's have a drink. There's a wee wifey waiting and a wee butt in bed. <laughs> that's, that means there's a, my wife's waiting at home. There's a little baby in bed, but I'm going to have a drink anyway. If you can say it's a broad, bright moonlicht nicht. <laughs> if you can say there's a broad, bright moon out tonight. Then you're all right, you can. Then, then, therefore, if you can still speak that, then go ahead and have your drink. You're, you're not, you're not over the over the limit. Now, let me let me give you the other lines because this is really kind of funny. I like a man that is a man, a man that's straight and fair, the kind of man that will will and can in all things do his share. Ugh, I like a man, a jolly man, the kind of man you know, the chap that slaps your back and says, "Jock, just before you go," and then you yeah, have another drink before you go. <laughs> and everyone, you know, every, you leave one by one, so you have to toast every single person. So by the time you get home, you're um, plastered. I assume. I don't know. It's a great song. So, um, so Scottish whiskey, of course, through great marketing, through. Um, association with elegance and sophistication and whatever becomes becomes one of the most elite drinks and it is still today if you go in ounce per ounce it's one of the most expensive things you can buy in a in a liquor store because it's it's you know the decent stuff I'm, it starts at above fifty dollars a bottle so it's a lot of money so irish whiskey is a very different thing it follows a completely different path than the scottish it never became an elite drink it never became hev heavily industrialized, and it was never really geared for export. Although I have to say, I went to the um, I went to the Jameson factory in in Dublin um, last year, and uh, they don't actually make any <laughs> any whiskey there anymore. And it's a com complete commercial ripoff. So if you go to Dublin, don't go there. But the um, but they insisted that that at one point Irish whiskey really dominated the market, and I believe that's probably true. But for reasons I'm not sure of why, um, it's a different product than Scotch, and, and not quite as unique. Um, they like to say that they're three times distilled, and the person leading the tour kept saying three times distilled, but that means there's no flavor left in it if you do it three times. So in any case, different different product. Let me explain why. Irish whiskey is not dried over peat fire, so it doesn't get that smokiness. Okay? It's much easier to drink that, I, you know. Um, and there were and still are some factories, but Historically, whiskey with an EY in Ireland, right, is made illegally. It's usually done at home. You have a little pot still and you make your own pochin by yourself. Um, it is not aged in oak either. So you have something much closer to moonshine. Okay, it's just a clear liquid and um, what's in my glass right, right now with a little lime. Um, and all this developed largely because the English who wanted, who of course ruled Ireland, right, um, wanted to tax alcohol production, and the Irish basically said, no, we're not doing it. We're going to avoid it. We're going to move the whole production underground, and no matter what you do, we're, we're going to hide from you. And in the early 19th century, the English finally figured out a way that if they could encourage the whiskey uh, industry 
they could make more money by tax and consumption. So this, so there is a boom period for legal Irish whiskey in the in the early nineteenth century and the mid and up through the mid nineteenth century, but by the twentieth century, it collapsed almost entirely, um, and it was partly. Well, you know what happens in Ireland, right? There's a terrible potato famine. A million people die. Another million leave to go to the United States. Um, yeah, there's a mass, mass exodus. And the people in Ireland, for, for reasons that really have to do with avoiding the industrial scale of the whole thing, refuse to switch from pot stills to these new column stills, which will continuously... Um, distill, right? You can you can keep going 24 hours a day if you have a column still. With a pot still, you make a batch, you have to empty it, clean it, do the whole thing over again each time. So producers in Scotland and elsewhere in the world actually could distill much more quickly and they could sell it at a much more lower, uh, much lower price. So distillers in, um, and in fact, the distiller that still remains in Northern Ireland, Bushmills, uses this new technology. They use the column stills, the coffee still. And then um, in the course of wars, the World War I to start, um, all the barley was diverted into food production. You can make bread out of barley also. And, and of course you can eat it, you can throw it in soup, you can do whatever. So people thought, well, we shouldn't be distilling whiskey, which is less nutritious and because all the vitamins and stuff have been taken out. So, um, and then interestingly enough, the whole temperance movement um, led the government to efforts to curb consumption. So the um, so very interestingly in the twenties, the entire U.S. market, which was buying a lot of Irish whiskey, um, fell through during Prohibition. So there was nothing, absolutely nothing, sent over. And with Irish, and then in the twenties, the Irish had a war of independence, and they completely lost the English market also. So you can see just all these weird factors. Everything collapsed at once um, with all these. Um, so, and this wasn't helped by the fact that the Irish government was kind of desperate for revenue in these years. So they said, whatever we do, we have to tax the distilleries, just like the English did. So let's um, do that so we can fund our new government. Uh, so again, this leads more and more and more to illegal pochine. If you want to spell that, it's P-O-T-C-H-E-E-N. And the industry itself almost completely collapses. Now, in the past couple of decades, there has been a revival. Um, when I wrote this lecture a few several years ago, there were th basically three distilleries in Ireland. They had a couple of interesting brands. Um, at that time, there was 9.5 million gallons a year compared to Scotland's 215 million. Blows it out of the water, not even close. Um, the, the Irish are, are, um, are coming around. You know, there's, there's a very interesting little museum to um, whiskey production in, in Dublin. And I saw maybe two dozen different brands, tiny ones. And sometimes they're actually producing in the bigger distilleries. But that's, that's fine. You know, they're, they're doing what they can. And I venture to guess that, uh, well, gosh, in the past four years, I'm sure there's um, much increased um, production and export. If you look, at, look in the stores, it's not just Jameson's and Bushmills anymore. There's actually a handful of, of um, very interesting Irish whiskey. So it's, so it's rising up now. Now, especially, you know, since the, uh, you know, the Irish economy had a big boom and then it's sl slipping now. But, um, but the, the whiskey industry is actually doing okay. So let's talk about, you know, remember at the beginning of the course, I don't know how we ended up doing this, but we were listening to Finnegan's Wake. But I want to read you the words, okay? Maybe I'll, I'll be inspired to sing. Maybe I'll grab a guitar while I'm here too. Who knows? So Finnegan's Wake is a song... Um, I'm not sure you remember what happened in the song. Tim Finnegan lived in Walken Street, a gentle Irishman, mighty odd. He had a brogue, both rich and sweet, and to rise in the world, he carried a hod. A hod is a thing like this with a stick on it, and you put bricks in there, and it's hard work, and you carry the bricks. Okay? You see, he would a sort of a tippler's way, meaning he liked to drink, but for love of the liquor, poor Tim was born to help him on his way each day, He'd a drop of the creature every morn. And it's the um, chorus goes, Whack full of da, now dance to your partner round the floor, you trotter shake. It's your trotters, your feet. Uh, bend an ear to hear the truth they tell you. We had lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. Okay, so the, um, uh, this is someone telling the story of going to the wake after Finnegan died, what happened. 
And one morning, Tim got rather full. His head felt heavy, which made him shake. Fell from the ladder and he broke his skull. And they carried him home, his corpse to wake. Rolled him up in a nice clean sheet and laid him out upon the bed. A bottle of whiskey at his feet and a barrel of porter at his head. Porter is, is um, um, Guinness. <laughs> His friends assembled at the wake, and when a widow Finnegan called for lunch, first she brought in tea and cake, that's tea, then pipes, tobacco, and a whiskey punch. Biddy O'Brien began to cry, such a nice clean corpse did you ever see. Tim Avorim, why did you die? Will you hold your gob, said Patty McGee. Patty saying, shut the hell up, because they're there. They want to get down to drinking and not, not hearing some lady sob over. And Maggie O'Connor took up the cry. Oh, Biddy, she says you're wrong, I'm sure. Biddy gave her a belt in the gob and sent her sprawling on the floor. And the war did soon engage. Twas women to women and man to man. Shillelagh law was all the rage and a row and eruption soon began. So Shillelagh law means you grab your walking stick, you whack someone over the head with it. Do I have a shillelagh here? I might have one behind me. Anyway, you get, you'll get the idea. And Mickey Malone ducked his head when a bucket of whiskey flew at him. It missed him falling on the bed. The liquor scattered o'er Tim. Now the spirit's new life gave the corpse my joy. Tim jumped like a Trojan from the bed, crying, will you wallop each girl and boy? Tundering Jesus, do you think I'm dead? <laughs> So he's never dead at all. And they're fighting over his corpse. So it's a hilarious thing. And of, and of course, you know, the, the, the name of the song goes into the bizarre novel by James Joyce. But great stuff. Um, so what about American whiskey? Where does this come into the whole story? So as you can imagine, American whiskey is directly descended from Scots and Scottish-Irish Scots-Irish uh, settlers in the North American colonies. They're the ones who brought the distilling technology. And although if you look at the colonial era, rum is really the dis predominant drink. If you look at the larger cities, they distilled it in Boston, remember, and they spread it through much of the colonies and the triangular trade connected the Caribbean to the, to the East Coast. But if you go into the hinterland, you don't want to be, have to be carrying barrels of anything that are heavy and expensive. So what they drink is either Applejack, which is a local kind of whiskey made out of apples. In fact, the oldest distillery, I'll tell you about it eventually, is Laird's, which is right where I grew up in New Jersey, or whiskey. And whiskey, to start, is made from rye or wheat, because that's what people were used to using back in, in uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland and, and the Scots-Irish who came. Uh, used, that's what they knew how to do. And you all know our founding father, George Washington was, yeah, he was a farmer, but he was a distiller. And, his, just, and his, his whole distilling operation has been rebuilt in Mount Vernon. It's beautiful. I encourage you to go. Um, it's just been, and it's, they've been making whiskey there and selling it, which is, which is remarkable. It's, this, is, this is what our country was founded on. And you've probably heard of Washington, um, or actually it's Alexander Hamilton's fault. It's not Washington's, but Hamilton decided, yes, that Hamilton, to tax whiskey production to pay off the war debt after the colonial, um, after the American Revolution. And what happened is it inspired a, an infamous whiskey rebellion. This happened in 1791 all the way to 1794. And it was actually the first tax on any domestic product that the federal government ever tried to levy. This, they'd never done, remember the whole reason the United States, well, one of the reasons broke away from Britain was because they didn't want to pay taxes. And all of a sudden the federal government is doing exactly the same thing and taxing the one product they do not want to do without, which is whiskey. And the rebellion started in Western Pennsylvania, spread throughout the Appalachian Mountains, and a place which was largely settled by Scots-Irish who just kind of wanted to be left alone. They didn't, they didn't want to pay taxes, certainly. And there were several reasons for the rebellion. One, uh, Westerners converted leftover grain to alcohol. Remember, they have to sell this stuff and ship it really far. If it's too expensive to send there or the price goes down, change it into alcohol. You know, it's, a, it's a, easier to do. Easier to transport than, uh, than flour, yeast. 
They also tended to be small producers. So the way the tax was set up is they were hit harder with a tax per gallon. And this doesn't sound like a whole much, a whole lot, but it was nine cents per gallon. Nine cents is a lot of money in 1791. Um, and the Eastern distillers had a, a um, an option to pay a flat fee, which was more money up front, but they could pay it to the government and then they were tax free. Uh, and they could make however much they wanted, not pay that tax. So in the end, they actually paid a lot less. So it really, really favored the larger producers. And the, um, of course, the government liked having the money up front and the big producers said, we love this, this is great. We'll pay our, our, our flat fee. Um, and in fact, if you wonder why this happened, remember Hamilton was the one who said America will be an industrial nation and really started it. You know, Patterson, New Jersey was the first kind of industrial city in the country and he promoted it directly. Um, and this fits, this kind of fits all of his kind of policies to make America industrial against Thomas Jefferson, remember, who was the, the man who thought we would be an agrarian nation. So what happened? This is again, Western Pennsylvania distillers attacked the tax collectors. They tarred and feathered them. Not pleasant. They threatened open rebellion, and George Washington sent in 13,000 federal troops. This is the first time they were deployed, as far as I know, outside of the, the revolution itself. Uh, there wasn't actual fighting, but the larger issue, of course, is can the federal government randomly declare taxes when they need money? Uh, that's exactly what the British were doing, taxation without representation or without any popular vote of any kind. So, so the idea is, of course they could, right? And the timing of this is very interesting. So, so they came in, they forced the tax down their throats. But when Jefferson was elected, this is 1801, he just said, I'm abolishing this tax. I'm not going to discourage small production in favor of industrial production because then they're all going to, people are just going to drink more. Remember, he wanted people to drink wine, but he said, you know, if it's a small production, it's going to stay local. They're not going to ship very far, and there will be less of it in the long run. So he abolished the tax, and the point, the big point I want to make, I want you to remember, is there was no tax on booze until the Civil War. So it's for the whole first half of the 19th century. Um, and so whiskey, I know this sounds really strange, led to the formation of political parties in the U.S. It was That was one very big issue in uh, the election of 1801. There were not political parties until then. And if you're thinking about our current election and the divisiveness of the nation between parties, which of course was never planned by the founding fathers, you have whiskey to thank for this. <laughs> you have a lot of good things too, but this is one of them. So the other irony, of course, that Jefferson really wanted a wine industry in the U.S., and that didn't succeed in his lifetime. But um, And he couldn't get Congress to lower the import duties on French wine. He really wanted to drink the good stuff also. But he argued that taxes on wine are, in effect, a prohibition of its use to the middle class of our citizens and a condemnation of them to the poison of whiskey, which is desolating their houses. No nation is drunken where wine is cheap and none sober where wine substitutes ardent spirits as the common beverage. Wine, in truth, is the only antidote to the bane of whiskey. And you can understand, you know, where he's coming from is wine. You can't drink a whole lot of it. You know, it's, it's just impossible and it's expensive. And he said, it should be cheap. We shouldn't tax it. Ordinary people should be able to buy it. Even if it's imported, they should be able to buy it. As opposed to whiskey, which goes down quickly and makes you drunk quickly. So as I mentioned, it, um, it wasn't all grain-based alcohol either. And this is one of the great American spirits I want to linger on for just a moment. This is called Apple Jack. It's a completely indigenous spirit um, distilled from fermented apple juice. Apple juice ferments really easily. If you're not pasteurizing it, you leave it out, it starts bubbling, it ferments all on its own. And the 18th century, it was actually one of the more popular drinks uh, in the American colonies. Is, is uh, you know, apple orchards were planted all over the place. Uh, think of um, think of Johnny Appleseed. His name was Jonathan Chapman, and in the middle of the country, in the whole Ohio Valley, he planted apple seeds everywhere in expectation that people were going to move in and apple orchards would be uh, 
He could sell them saplings, actually. There was a great businessman. He was a little nuts, but he was, uh, you know, this, this was all planned out. Uh, but the point is that there weren't wine grapes, and the use of grains out in the um, middle of the country at this point was mostly for bread making. If you had grain, you put it to bread for bread as a staple, remember? So you put it to that before you distilled it, which takes longer and is, doesn't nourish as much. And remember that there is no inland transportation yet. There's no canals built, there's no railroads, those are long away. So it made sense to trade in spirits that are higher in alcohol rather than cider or beer. So there's an encouragement to take this cider that they're drinking, very, very easy to make, and do something else with it. Now, there's, there, there are spirits that are kind of like this elsewhere in the world. In Normandy, you have something called Calvados, which is an apple brandy. Um, but the flavor of Applejack is actually a little sweeter, strangely, because it's made from sweet apples. It's made of apples like wine saps and delicious, and, and it's not made of dry apples that would normally go into making cider. So it's got a very different kind of fruity flavor to it. Um, and there is actually no historical connection between the two spirits. Um, they're, they're certainly the Englishman who came from, say, Somerset in the West Country to the U.S., to the early colonies, would have known how to make cider, but they didn't distill it there. So, so it's an entirely new thing in the, in the uh, young colonies and early republic. And a simple kind of Applejack, the way it's originally made is actually even, even more interesting. The, the word means you take fermented cider, um, you, leave, you ferment it, and then you put it outside when it starts to freeze. And on the East Coast, of course, by you know November, December, it gets really cold and freezes. And what happens is the water will freeze before the alcohol, and you get a layer of ice on top of the cider. You take that off, and what you have is then you, you jack <laughs> The, the, I won't say it's what I'm thinking, but anyway, you take that off and, um, and you're throwing away the water and essentially you have a, um, a concentrated higher alcohol drink that's called jacking, okay? Uh, that's supposedly the origin of the term, though strangely, there is another, there's a dessert in uh, England called an apple jack, which has nothing, it's like a turnover. It has nothing to do with the, with the drink. But in any case, eventually when they get stills out in these places, they boil the cider, they condense the steam, and you get a much higher, a spirit much higher in alcohol. Applejack is, you know, can be 40%. It's like any other alcohol. It's usually aged in oak barrels. It's kind of like brandy in the end. Um, now, most Applejack in the colonial era was done on a very small local scale. An orchard owner would make their own Applejack. But the commercial distilling of Applejack dates to 1780. There's a company called Laird's Applejack, which started in Colts Neck, New Jersey. It's now Scobieville, which is right down the road. And that is actually the, the country's first licensed distillery. And I used to ride my bike there. <laughs> no, I'm serious. This is to, to Colts Neck. It was, a, it was a great orchard there. And so it was, you know, when I was young, it was, it's a few miles away. And George Washington um, is said to have received the recipe for Applejack from the guy Robert Laird. It's a very Scottish name. He's the company founder. He fought in the American Revolution. He knew Washington. And then um, in the 19th century, they moved out of this little old house, which is still sitting there on the side of the road. And, um, um, oh, actually, maybe it burned down. I don't remember. In any case, they moved um, to nearby Scobieville. And it's still in the same family, which traces its origin to William Laird, who settled in Monmouth County, New Jersey, from Scotland in the year 1698, and and apparently just started distilling Applejack then. So it's 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 our it's our um, for, in a way it's kind of our first you know national drink oddly enough, and it's become so obscure now. It's really you can find it. Um, I think Applejack is also entwined with the history of Western expansion. Remember uh, Johnny Appleseed planting saplings throughout the Ohio Valley in advance of settlement. Um, and again, these are not apples to eat, but to drink. The trees were open pollinated. They weren't grafted. He just let them cross however they want. And some would be great for eating and some would be fine, sour. You, that's okay. You throw them in for fermenting. Now, why Applejack lost dominance is also a very interesting story. It has to do with the other spirits in competition and being produced on a much larger scale. So we have rum that distilled from molasses, which remember, the whole byproduct of the sugar industry. 
Eventually, very shortly, we'll have bourbon made from sour mash whiskey in, um, made from corn in Kentucky, Tennessee, because grain doesn't grow too well there. And increasingly, whiskey made from barley or rye grown throughout the Young Republic. So, so that really takes its place. But in the 20th century, Applejack was pushed even further into obscurity by the popularity of other drinks like gin and vodka and eventually tequila. And, um, and though there are, there are a couple of mixed drinks that kept Laird's in business, um, incidentally, this stuff is called Jersey Lightning, if you want to find it. Uh, the most popular of these is the cocktail called the Jack Rose. It's, it's Apple Jack, lemon juice, and a dash or two of grenadine. Um, and the proportions vary depending on what source you read. But today, um, the, the weird thing is Applejack now, is, Laird's in fact, is made in a factory in Virginia. It's, it's neutral grain spirits, flavorless alcohol that is mixed with apple flavoring and other crap. It's really pretty bad. But they do make, perversely, a bonded 100 proof apple brandy. And now that's the real Applejack. That's the one, and you can find it. It's, it's for sale in any really good liquor store. Um, it's intensely perfumed. You would never mix it with anything. It just has this aroma of sweet apples that's lovely. And that's, that's probably like the original one. So now we get to the, the truly American spirit. It's bourbon, of course. And there are many stories of the pe first people who invented bourbon. They're mostly written up by ad agencies <laughs> that are paid for by distillers. And some will say, and there are names with brands that still claim to be the originators. Some will say it's Elijah Craig, who was the first preacher who fa figured out how to toast the barrels. Um, but of course, toasting barrels was nothing new. Um, Others claim it's Evan Williams, which the, and the bottle says the first commercial distillery since 1783. Um, Applejack has it beaten. Uh, the, the Samuels family also claims to be the oldest, also from 1783, although they only went into the business commercially since 1840. Um, and the Samuels family still exists. They, they sell Maker's Mark. Um, the first person who is said to have set up a still commercially um, is Jacob Beam, and the company has stayed in the family of direct descendants down through seven generations from, uh, from uh, 1795, which is pretty amazing. And Jim Beam, you know, is probably the biggest um, bourbon distiller, but it's, um, and, the, and the most prevalent and affordable, but it's, it's actually, it's real bourbon, you know? So, <clears throat> so there's a lovely book, um, on, by the title of Alcoholic Republic, which claims, um, I think with very good evidence, that America became the alcohol-consuming place on Earth without any comparison. Um, a staggering consumption of whiskey took place uh, in the early Republic with 9.5 gallons per year for every man and woman over 15. Now, to give you a comparison, 9.5 gallons. Today, it's 0.7 in consumption. And that largely, and, and I think that increase has to do with the invention of bourbon. It's simply corn fermented with a sour mash. Now, what do I mean by that? Sour mash means it's lactobacillic fermentation. Um, it's bacteria uh, as well as yeast. So the same sort of thing that makes sourdough. And it makes a kind of sour corn beer to start with. And that is distilled. It then goes, as I said, into new oak barrels. Has to be new, and um, and it's again, it's, it's it's totally indigenous. There's nothing like this anywhere else in the world. Corn, of course, is native. And why production focused on Kentucky? And there there is actually a Bourbon County, Kentucky, um, that was originally part of Virginia. It was you know Virginia was cut in half, um, and, uh, cut in thirds actually for West Virginia too, and then. Um, and, and then covered most of the eastern part of what's now Kentucky. Um, the funniest thing is there's, there are no distilleries in Bourbon County. That's the really weird thing. So how did it get this weird name? Um, it's, they're not in that part of the state. So concentration in this area, um, you know, in, in Kentucky at least, has to do with the water quality, very high um, amount of limestone in there. But most importantly, it's the transport. So that you can get the stuff out of there down the Ohio River, the Ohio 
feeds into the Mississippi. The Mississippi goes down to New Orleans. Then you're on the coast. You can, you're in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. You can take it anywhere. So, the, um, so what happened, strangely, is distillers head west. They want to escape the excise tax that's levied in Virginia and in Pennsylvania. And so they just move the whole operation to the, other, to, to, to the west and consolidate there. Um, and start distilling um, far away from where, well, eas in eas easily transported down, but not where the tax people are going to find them. So, and, and what, what's also very interesting is it's not even called bourbon until the 19th century. There's one recent theory, which may be true, I don't know, by a guy named Michael Veach, who's ex who uh, suggests that the name does not come from Bourbon County, Kentucky. Bourbon, remember, is a French word, but it comes from Bourbon Street in New Orleans, where they sold this whiskey. So you think of bourbon going into drinks, where are they all consuming it? It's down in New Orleans. Okay, that's, that's an important part of this whole thing. Um, and contrary to what many people think, is you can make bourbon anywhere in the United States. It doesn't have to be in Kentucky. It doesn't have to be in, the, in, in the, that county, certainly not, and certainly not in that state. 95% of it is made in Kentucky. Um, and in fact, when I first did the research for this, there were about 5 million barrels aging right now, and that's larger than the state population. So there's more, more whiskey there than people. Um, and bourbon, I should mention, is not all corn. It's 51%. It's, uh, uh, the rest can be rye or wheat or even malted barley, and every distillery has their own different proportion, which will change the flavor entirely. So a few years ago, I think this was 2010, uh, two young women and I got in a car, spent a week hitting every single distillery along what's called the Bourbon Trail, uh, and then maybe even a few more on top of that. I think it was about 14 distilleries we hit that today, which is not too bad to a day. Um, and I have to tell you, Maker's Mark is so pretty. It's a lovely place. Buffalo Trace has the coolest factory. It's just this huge, bulking 19th century monstrosity where I'll, I'll never forget, as they were distilling this stuff, the person leading the door said, hold your hands out. And I thought, what? You're going to pour this into my hands? Okay. Came right out of the still, poured it into my hands, and <laughs> went like this to drink it. It evaporated. It was, uh, my, and my hands felt cold. You know how it saps energy as uh, something evaporates? It was 100% pure alcohol. It just disappeared. She put a little, few drops, it was gone. So, in any case, the um, let's think about in class about the cultural associations of bourbon. It's largely the result of, uh, you know, brilliant marketing. And of course, Jack Daniels and Jim Beam are the iconic. But let's think of some of the other ones that really are collected now, believe it or not. Uh, Pappy Van Winkle is really an expense. It's a beautiful thing, but it's, um, it's gotten a strange cult following. And somehow bourbon has now gone from a kind of um, not exactly elite drink to having this very genteel kind of following. Of, uh, of, of connoisseurs of, of good bourbon. Um, so I also want you to think about the songs because there's great music. Um, Muddy Waters, Whiskey Blues, um, I think um, Lightning Hopkins, Ain't Nothing Like Whiskey. Uh, if you want to really think about where the roots of American rock are, it's right there. It's, it's in these, in these uh, the blues, uh, basically, in this whole... Um, path that goes from the sort of Kentucky and Tennessee down to New Orleans. Um, and there are tons of American songs about bourbon. I think we should actually listen to them in class. But think of, uh, you know, George Thorogood, you know, one bourbon, one whiskey. And think, of course, of the Alabama song, which is Kurt Vile, but the Doors did a great version of it. I think we should listen to all these in class. Oh, get me to the next whiskey bar. We must have whiskey or die. It's, it's just, it's hilariously fun. Um, and of course, the only way bourbon really does become sophisticated the four recent years is to mix it into a magnificently wonderful cocktail, the mint julep, which you must have if you go to the Kentucky Derby in a silver tumbler with muddled mint leaves. Um, or... And I must say, this is the perfect cocktail. Nothing even comes close on earth. It is the Manhattan. Um, properly made, it's with bourbon. It's one very large hand-cut ice cube, or actually a round sphere of ice even works better because it has uh, less surface area and, and dilutes the drink less. A drizzle of red sweet vermouth, 
a real maraschino cherry, not the, the fake red thing, <laughs> which is made in Oregon and is really pretty dreadful. Um, and then a little dash of Angostura bitters. This is made of bark and it's got a flavor that just livens up the, the, the bourbon. Um, and I actually like it even better if you make it with real rye. Rye has a spiciness, some kind of little bite to it that's not quite as sweet as, uh, as bourbon. And if you uh, take the same drink, if you use scotch instead of bourbon, you have what's called a Rob Roy. <clears throat> if you have a perfect Manhattan, it actually combines sweet vermouth and dry vermouth in equal proportions, so it's a little less sweet. So um, very nice drink also. If you have a Brooklyn cocktail, that's a just dry vermouth, vermouth not the sweet, and a maraschino liqueur. And, and it's, it's, a, it's not the red syrup that you're thinking of, it's actually clear. Um, made of a marasque, which is a type of cherry that grows in mostly Yugoslavia, and um, lovely, lovely flavor. And the Bronx cocktail, which is a magnificent thing. It's basically a martini with orange juice, if you think about it that way. And the Queens is, a, is with pineapple juice. So these are, you know, these were all named in the 30s and 40s. But, um, but if you want something that is <clears throat> really speaks of New Orleans, a drink that probably is where these associations come from to start with, um, find out about a Sazerac. Okay, that ranks up there with the Manhattan. It's got a splash of the local licorice flavored uh, liqueur called Herb Sant. It originally would have had adds absinthe in it. And, um, and then rye. Originally it would have had cognac. And in fact, Sazerac was a brand name of cognac, ironically. And then a very special kind of bitters, which I don't think are as good as Angostura, but they're, they're redder and sweeter. It's called Peychaud bitters, P-E-Y-C-H-A-U-D. And that is the official drink of New Orleans. If you go to New Orleans, you must have a Sazerac. It's, it's ma magnificent, not a hurricane, trust me. Um, a Missouri Mule, it was, which was Harry Truman's favorite drink, is bourbon, Campari, Cointreau, lemon juice, um, I've seen versions that have Applejack in it too, oddly enough, but that's, that is a magnificent <laughs> drink. And it's, it's not like a Moscow Mule, right? Moscow Mule has ginger, ginger ale and vodka and lime. This is bourbon and Campari, and that combination is exquisite. I don't even think you need the Cointreau, really. Um, and, you know, so just bourbon and Campari is an amazing combination on ice. Uh, there's another drink called Four Horsemen. It's a really terrible idea. <laughs> the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, of course. It's Jack, Jim, Johnny, and Jameson. So it's Jack Daniels, Jim Bean, Johnny Walker, and Jameson's Irish Whiskey. Why you would mix those four things is beyond me. Um, sometimes people put tequila in it or rum, and sometimes they set it on fire. Just don't do that. Just, just tell me you're not going to ever think of that. Um, and of course, although scotch really should never be mixed, there is a uh, drink. There are a few, Rob Roy and uh, the Rusty Nail, which is mixed with Drambuie, which is a Scots-based liqueur, which is really nice, heathery flavor to it. But in any case, if you're going to find the good stuff of any of these, you don't need to mix them. If you want, strangely enough, water does improve it. I know it sounds really weird, but it opens the aroma, lowers the alcohol just a little, but it makes the, um, the nose better. Ice actually um, will dilute your drink a little, but it will chill it, and then I, I think it's... The way to do it, I think. Um, you know, it's a little harder to drink. Most of these are harder to drink just straight. But if you buy really expensive stuff and you find yourself a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle, don't do anything to it <laughs> except drink it. Okay? So we'll, we'll come back and we'll, um, we'll listen to some music on Monday. See ya.